Hey folks, over the last couple weeks I've had quite a few requests on my streams and previous videos to make a proper update to the Frostclaw Static Orb Sorcerer, and here we are, this is what it is. I've had some time to really fine-tune the build and get it to a point where I believe it is fairly min-maxed. Uh, this build, I don't say this very often, but I do believe that this is one of, if not the, best builds in the game. It's very rare that you're able to have a build that not only can one-shot any boss in the game up to and beyond a thousand corruption, it can also move extremely fast at over 180% move speed. You're also very tanky. Even doing a thousand corruption, you can survive quite a lot of damage. You also have crazy AoE. You can pretty much just right-click with your Frostclaw and clear entire screens from all the overlapping AoE of, of Spark Charges. The build basically doesn't have weaknesses, and that's why I believed this might be the best build in the game. Anyway, if you end up finding this guide helpful, please leave a like on the video, as a lot of time and effort goes into this, and that is currently the best way to support me and the content I make. To kick things off, I'm going to start by talking about how the build works, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about how you start playing this build, what you need to transition, and some of the minimum requirements to get started. Anyway, let's uh, talk a little bit about how the build works. So the idea of this build specifically is that you have a very strong AoE skill, and you also have a very strong single target skill, and you're able to fit them both into the build so that you excel at both. So in that case, our AoE skill is Frostclaw. The reason why Frostclaw is so good is because in 1.1, they added this node in Sorcerer, where you apply a spark charge for every hit with a 40 plus mana cost skill. So in this case, we are running above 40 mana cost on our Frostclaw, and Frostclaw, if you don't know, applies an insane number of hits per cast. We're talking like potentially over 20 hits. So the amount of spark charges you apply is absolutely insane. And because of the Enigma, you have quite a bit of AoE on those spark charges. They all overlap. And when you shoot into a pack of enemies, they basically immediately die. And like the damage in packs of enemies is absolutely absurd. And the more closely packed they are, the more density of the monsters, the more damage you'll do. You'll notice when there are uh, rare monsters or a boss inside of a pack of monsters, if you do happen to hit them, most of the time, the boss or rare monsters will also get one shot along with the pack. So that's how the AoE works. It's extremely strong. Then for single target, we take this to the next level with Static Orb, which in the current game is extremely strong with single target. As you saw in the first clip, uh, we are able to one shot Aberroth with it. We're also able to one shot bosses like Shade of Orbis and Timeline bosses at 1000 Corruption with ease, uh, much easier than Aberroth even. T4 Jewelra is basically a joke. So that's how that works. They both benefit from mana stacking. So Static Orb gets a lot of damage from mana stacking. So the more mana you have, the more damage you do with Static Orb. That helps your damage here a lot. And for Sorcerer, we get a bunch of our mana back as well with mana stacking. All this goes very well. Also with the ward gained per current mana. So you'll see we gain quite a significant amount of ward when casting our spells. So while going through echoes or fighting a boss, you have pretty high ward numbers, so that's very good. Uh, the other thing that you need to know about the build is that we have a crazy amount of mobility. Um, this goes up to 180% when I'm in the echoes and fighting stuff. Right now we're at 150. Um, but yeah, at 180%, you're also multiplying all that damage, or I guess I'll say converting that movement speed into spell damage. So 3% spell damage per 1% move speed. That's over 500% increased damage from Wrong Warp which is like absolutely absurd. It's very, very strong. Um, we also get a little bit of invulnerability on our teleport. It's kind of nice, gives you a small stun. Um, you get a huge amount of cast speed and move speed. It's very good stuff. That's why I personally think Wrong Warp is probably the best option for the build. Uh, we'll talk about a bit, another option later, but yeah, that's how that works. And also for mobility, we are using Swiftness, the Flames of Midnight Ring. This is pretty insane. Uh, it's actually an incredible ring. I think a lot of people are sleeping on this right now, but it is very, very good, especially if you're using Wrong Warp. Swiftness gives you plus 20% move speed, so that's 60% increased damage here. And it also gives you a screen-wide teleport on a four-second cooldown. So you can see right there, when you use a fire skill, you get a little spirit, 
and you can evade to it. And then the spirit goes back to where you were. This is actually extremely underrated, very, very strong. It gives you an absurd amount of mobility. You can just zoom through echoes very, very quickly or temporal sanctum, whatever it is you're running. You have like sub 90 second temporal sanctums with this build, which is really, really nice if you want to slam items. It's very good for that. Or just speed farming echoes, boss killing, whatever you want to do. You basically have it. Uh, for the boss killing itself, you swap out Disintegrate, you grab Arcane Ascendance, that's how that works. This is how you get more damage. When you're running Echoes, you run Disintegrate for the Midnight Ring. Moving on to uh, transitioning into build and getting started. This is more of an endgame build, as I said. There are going to be some gear requirements before this particular version of the build feels good. Uh, I have already made a guide on a pure Frostclaw setup that you can actually start pretty much at like level 51-ish, uh, and it will be immediately very strong. You'll be able to clear everything. Uh, a lot of people have had quite a bit of success. I League started with it. To use Static Orb, you do need a lot of mana, and that's the kind of limiting factor to make that transition, is without a lot of mana, Static Orb will not be worth it. You will continue using Pure Frostclaw. I will put a link to the uh, Pure Frostclaw guide in the description. So until you have roughly 1300 mana and probably at least 100 intelligence, until you have both of those criteria, ideally also a wrong warp, um, you're going to want to continue using Pure Frostclaw or some other build of your choosing. But yeah, those I think those gear requirements will suit you quite well to get started. If you want, you can kind of cheese it out a bit earlier with some gear swaps. So something like Fractured Crown, it takes away all your ward but it does give you a insane boost to your uh, your single target damage with Static Orb. You get a crazy amount of crit multi, mana, and whatever. So this uh, can potentially allow you to start using it a little bit sooner. If you have these items, uh, Fractured Crown, by the way, if you don't know, this is a Rune of Ascendance recipe. You can craft this. Um, I won't go over that in the video, but if you want, you can probably find videos on YouTube of how to do that. Uh, so this is pretty good to get burst damage for bosses. Uh, yeah, same with Confluence of Fate, but we'll go over that in a bit. Anyway, that's uh, that's the basics of what you need to get started. Uh, we'll go into a bit more details of the build now and explain some of the some of the items. So we'll start with that. Uh, so I have some items here and some different alternates that you can use. Uh, we'll start with the helmet. There's a lot of confusion around uh, the helmet. So Prismatic Gaze is very important for the general running of Echoes because you need that base crit. It's very important that you get your crit chance up because we do have a lot of crit multi. Prismatic Gaze is one of the few items that you can get that get base crit. You can see this one has 4% crit chance. This is very important. Uh, another thing that gives base crit is the Phantom Grip Ring, so you can use both of these. I know a lot of people are asking about using Peak of the Mountain. This does not give base crit. If you don't have any other base crit on your gear anywhere else, Fant uh, Peak of the Mountain here will not actually help you that much. So if you don't know the base crit, there's 5%. Uh, and if you only have increased crit chance and no base crit, that means that you need almost 2,000% increased crit chance to reach crit cap. If you're at, for example, 10% base crit, you need about half of that. So it's a huge difference. Peak of the Mountain is not useful unless you're using Phantom Grips, and I still don't even know if it's that great. Uh, so yeah, I think Prismatic Gaze is probably the best in slot here. Uh, the priority here is getting the crit chance. Uh, getting Legendary on it is nice, but you do want to get that crit chance. Uh, continuing along the helmet, so Fractured Crown, as I said, this can be a swap for one-shotting bosses. This makes it much easier to get the one-shot off. Uh, the Bone Clamor, I don't know. This might be a good option if you're using double Phantom Grip, otherwise you're not going to have enough crit chance. So if you have double phantom grip for base crit, you can slam int on this. It's much easier to get LP than prismatic gaze. This with int could be very good. You get a bunch of ward regen too, which is a bit of tankiness, a lot of armor. This is a potential option, still leaning towards prismatic gaze. And if you have nothing else, you can use an exalted helm with plus four static orb. Uh, in endgame, you can potentially have static orb on your prismatic gaze and then not have to do any gear swaps. That is an option. Um, but yeah, in general, I think you're going to want either Prismatic Gaze with Int for more Frostclaw damage, or Prismatic Gaze with Static Orb for more Static Orb damage. 
The next thing I'll talk about is the catalyst. So this is another potential source of crit chance. If you are still working with uh, mid-tier-ish gear, you're probably going to want to swap into a crystal skull when doing uh, bosses. So that's what I do if I want more damage. I'll just do a swap here. This has base crit, so that will help you get to crit cap uh, with your static orb. For the clear, you really do need Enigma because Enigma applies the spark charge uh, damage scaling. You see the plus two flat lightning per int. So this is very important for AoE. This is very important for single target, assuming that your gear is not very, very strong. So definitely keep that in mind. Moving on to the chest piece, I personally think that the unstable core is the best option for this build. It gives us quite a bit of armor, but the main thing here is it gives us a lot of mana. It also gives us levels too, which is really nice. It's a very good chest piece. The static shell, it could be an option. I probably wouldn't use this if you don't have a good slam on it, or if you already have a better unstable core, use that instead. This is better, uh, but this does give us a bunch of armor. So if you have quite a bit of armor and you want more defense, this could be an option. Uh, there's also a more multiplier on lightning damage, so this could be a thing. I don't think it's best in slot, but it is an option. The core of the mountain is interesting because it gives a bunch of armor and all attributes. All attributes gives us a lot of useful stuff. So attunement is mana. Int is damage for our frost claw. Personally, I think that the core of the mountain might be best in slot if you are focusing on maxing your frost claw damage. So this will scale your spark charges. If you want maximum AOE clear, speed clearing echoes, this might be your best. I think unstable is the best overall though. For the amulets, uh, there's quite a few options here, but you do want mana, so Strong Mind is good. It's very easy to get LP on this. These drop like candy. If you don't have that, hey, Exalt is totally fine. Crit multi, mana, all that stuff is good. Frailty is good. Shred is good. All of this stuff is good. Uh, you can get resists here if you don't have them. Amulet is pretty flexible, but in general, you probably want mana somewhere. Um, so yeah, that's what I have here. Another really good one is Orion's Eye. This can get a lot of mana. So potentially up to 150. It's very rare to get these and it's even harder to get LP. So I wouldn't count on doing it. If you do get it, you don't need Void Res though, which is very nice. Uh, that's what I'm currently using. I haven't got a good slam yet. Don't know if I will, but there you go. This is another good option. For maximum single target damage, you do want to use the Confluence of Fate. This is a huge boost to your damage. Uh, so just looking at the tooltip here, 493 put that on 570 and that's all being scaled by everything as well so the damage is actually a bit larger than that um so yeah that is uh, quite strong this gives us a bunch of flat damage and i guess a lot of people are a little bit confused on this the damage doesn't need to be the same type as the skill you're using so you can add flat necrotic damage to static orb and it will benefit the skill it's still being scaled by all of the more multipliers and everything, minus the lightning specifically. So flat damage is very important. Wands, the wrong warp has a lot of really good stuff for us. It's huge, huge boost to our damage and mana and basically everything. Very nice. Uh, but the Marina's wand here has a lot of flat damage. You can see spell necrotic and then more spell necrotic on the uh, affixes here. So this is, I think, one of the higher flat damage wands in the game. It also has a huge amount of increased spell damage, which is further scaling. It has some cast speed, which is nice. It doesn't do that much. Um, but yeah, this is a very strong wand. Probably going to be one of the better options for one-shotting bosses. I don't know if it beats wrong warp endgame, uh, but it probably comes fairly close because of the flat damage it adds. Uh, so that's up to you. I think wrong warp is going to be better overall, though. Ladle is not really adding much flat damage so i don't think it's the best for static orb however for the spark charges where you're getting all your flat damage from the enigma ladle is generally best in slot for spark charge so this is an option if you're just going for the pure spark charge echo clear although wrong warp gives a bunch of move speed so it's it's hard to say what's actually better but i do think that it could be an option to getting more damage on your spark charges because you have that more multiplier free shred and all that stuff so this could be an option, um, still leaning towards wrong warp is best in slot. For the rings, we have quite a few options here. Um, as I mentioned, Flames of Midnight is insane, gives you swiftness, which when you're using wrong warp is also damage. 
it gives you a little bit of hen here, which works with the uh, Confluence of Fate, uh, but that's sort of not the main reason. Uh, it's mainly for the spirit step here and the swiftness. So as you saw in the beginning, I went over the teleporting uh, using Disintegrate. It's very strong. I think this ring is one of the best in slots. It helps if you can get LP. Not mandatory, but it is nice. Uh, for maximum single target damage, you're going to want a Jewelra's Star Dial. If you're not able to one-shot bosses, if you can get any sort of slam on this, or even maybe not even one at all, you're going to get an insane amount of damage. Uh, it's important that you do your burst in the window here where you're getting your stats are tripled. So this would be 180% spell damage and, uh, what, 42 int or something? So that's pretty insane. Um, yeah, so this would be probably best in slot for single target damage. The Phantom Grip is another very good option. It gives us mana and base crit, both of which are very strong. It also has crit on the implicit. This could be a good, good item early on to get some crit chance for your static orb. Um, also the mana scaling damage. So this is a very good item. You can consider using this if you want. It's kind of up to you. There's some flexibility here. Another very endgame option could be Red Ring. It's a little bit hard to reach the 180 attributes on this because we're sort of hybrid with mana and int. But if you are able to get to 180 like I am here, Red Ring is still a very strong ring. If you somehow manage to get two of these with int, um, you can run double Red Ring if you want. It gives a little bit of move speed, a bunch of res, this is an option. It'll make you very tanky because of the DR, uh, but it, it is up to you. Uh, definitely not mandatory, but uh, I guess a nice to have. For the belts, I think the best in slot is probably Strands of Souls because of how much mana we're spending. We spend a significant amount of mana between Static Orb, Frostclaw, and even when you get the free spell with Teleport, you still get the benefit from that, so that's pretty cool. Uh, it is a little bit hard to get the LP on it, but if you do get it, it's nice to have a good roll. The roll range is large. So if possible, uh, you want the highest mana spent gained as word here with, I think, reduced bonus damage taken from crit. I think this is a good spot to get it. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty good as well. Another option is Praetorium Belt. This has a lot of armor. Armor is very good for defense. If you want an Exalted Belt, I think this is one of the best options. If you want a little bit more speed and damage, you can use the Divine Girdle. I don't really think it's worth it to get 8% more move speed in exchange for some of the other options here, like flat armor. Uh, but yeah, if you really want to go zoomy, go fast, um, this is going to be an option for you. Uh, then moving on to the gloves, I personally really like the Eternal Gauntlets because of how much flat armor and DOT mitigation they give. This is very strong. They're pretty hard to get good ones as COF. Um, so I guess uh, take that with a grain of salt. If you can manage to get these, these are very nice. I have one with T7 mana, T5 int. Uh, you could also get your Shred and Frailty here, because we don't have it with uh, Wrong Warp by default, so this is an option. Uh, there's a few different things you can do in the glove slot, but this is one of them. Another one would be the Mana Gloves here. You get a little bit of mana. I don't know if it's worth giving up all this armor, but this is another one of the better bases that you could use in the glove slot. Another one is Weaver. This gives a little bit of mana and all attribute, which is even more mana. It uh, gives you a little bit more damage uh, when they're low health. Uh, that's nice. The main thing here is you could potentially get something like T7 in T7 mana, uh, and then maybe some something useful on the suffix. I think endgame, this could end up being one of the better options for damage, but uh, it is a little bit challenging to get a good weaver, so uh, try it if you want. You might get lucky. Um, yeah, it's a good option. Then for boots, I still think the Blood of the Exile is best in slot. We get a lot of benefit from move speed, and you can potentially get, I think, the most move speed on this. This is one of the highest move speed boots in the game, and it also comes with int and strength, and even dex, which helps with uh, red ring if you're using that. But strength is armor percent, which is very strong. Int is all the great stuff we get from int already, like our spark charge damage. It's very hard to compete with these boots. Uh, they're, I just think they're best in slot. Even, even if you only have 1 LP, or even 0 LP, they're already very strong. Another one here is Telfoons. This is not as good as Blood the XL, but it can be a placeholder if you have nothing else. It has 12 int. I probably wouldn't use this if you don't have a slam on it, so like more int or move speed or something. 
but yeah, this could also be an option. Not necessarily better than a very good Exalted boot, but you could consider this. Uh, another one here, we have Transient Rest. If you're having generally running around with high mana, this can give you a pretty big boost of ward. Uh, it also has a lot of resists, some move speed. It's not a bad boot. Uh, if you like this mechanic of getting ward when you stop moving every two seconds, it does also seem like it works with Evade. This could be an option for you. Uh, not a huge fan, but you might like it, so give it a try. Then moving on to Relic, I think that the best option by far is the Storm Carved. This gives us a crazy amount of stuff for a build. We get flat damage, which as we know is good. We get Lightning Pen, which is pretty good. It doesn't benefit the uh, non-Lightning damage, but it's still... Uh, it's still quite good. And we also get a bunch of free resists. We get shock chance. We get a huge amount of flat mana and then even more flat mana from attunement. If you can get LP on this and then slam it, this is like an insane relic. It's so good for this build. Uh, another potential option that's a bit of a wild card is the uh, Grimoire of Necrotic Elixirs. Here you get a significant amount of flat damage. So this is a potential option if you want more flat damage. I think it's going to be very hard for this to be better than the Storm Carved, though, uh, considering you already have a decent amount of flat damage and you're losing all of that mana and all that other good stuff, so uh, probably not. Maybe if you have a 4 LP and you don't have a good Storm Carved, it might be worth it. It's it's hard to say. It's, it's worth considering, though. Then moving on to the idols. Uh, so for the idols, you are going to want to get a lot of your mana and filling out any resists if you're lacking. This is where you would do that. So you have a lot of options for mana here on your idols. You have the prefix and suffix for the uh, grand idols can give you mana. The big idols, you can get a up to 12%. These are pretty strong. There's not that many useful prefixes, uh, but you uh, you can kind of work around and see, see what you like with that. Uh, for the small idols, you can get mana and then resist. Uh, for these idols, um, where are they? The other ones, there's not really much you can do here other than resist. I think dodge is probably the best prefix, or maybe stun chance. Uh, stun chance is useful, so there is that. And yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much it for the gear. Jumping over to blessings, you have a few options here for what you want, but I think in general, you'll be safe to go with double armor here. This is a huge amount of defense. Uh, we're somewhere around like 3,000 armor, and a big part of it is from this. For the um, Grand Blessing of Humanity, the All Res is huge. This is very important, helps with your resist. We do get some crit reduction for free from the Rune Master Tree, so I don't think Crit Avoid is that great here. Um, so yeah, All Res, generally a safe bet. Crit Multi is very good. We're stacking Crit. Crit Multi is uh, best in slot. Win. Then we have mana. So this one is a bit of a flex slot. There is lightning shred in this spot that you could potentially get, but since some of our damage is not lightning, we don't get full benefit from the lightning shred. So personally, I am preferring mana in this slot. Then if you're COF, as I always say, XP is the best because it gives you more favor. More favor means more items. So yeah, this one for COF. If you're Merchant Guild, I don't know, maybe gold. Uh, that's up to you. Moving on to the skills, we'll explain a little bit about how these work, what we're doing. So Frostclaw, there's a bit of flexibility with what you can do here, but the main thing is that it's extremely important that you stay above 40 mana, otherwise the spark charges doesn't work. The way you do that is by taking everything that increases mana costs and trying to limit the things that reduce mana costs. So here we have Volley of Glass, Hand of Morditis, and then these nodes down here, they all increase mana. So that'll get us up to 40. Uh, you probably want to avoid Frozen Rain and Gift of Winter and Celerity, depending on how much minus mana is on your weapon. So with everything else, it's somewhat flex pick, but personally, I try to get as much ward as I can, get a little bit more slow chance here. Uh, I take Raywind's Veil. This gives us a lot of ward for basically free. The crit chance, this does not help the crit chance of your spark charge. It's very important to be clear of that. The only reason why I take this personally is because it gives us more freeze rate multi, which means more ward, and then even more freeze rate multi. So this this is why I'm taking the crit. You still do need crit elsewhere on your gear for your spark charge and static work. As for the mana costs, as I mentioned, it depends on your weapon. See here I have a minus five. I will link my mana cost calculator spreadsheet in the description. 
But basically what you need to know is depending on how much mana costs you have on your weapon will determine whether or not you can run a point in Gift of Winter. So if you have a minus three rung warp, you can put one point in Gift of Winter and still be above 40. If you have a minus four or minus five rung warp, you cannot run Gift of Winter because it will put you below 40. So this is very, very important. If you're wondering why your Frost Claw is not working, that could be one of the reasons. Moving over to Static Orb next. Uh, this one is pretty simple. We're just trying to get as much damage as possible. Uh, so the main way we do that here is you have two nodes here which scale from mana orb hit per one mana cost. Then you also have maximum mana is added to the mana cost, and then you get damage per max mana. So this is the majority of our damage scaling here. Then we get a bunch of orbs for even more damage. We travel down here to get even more damage, and then we get even more damage to shock enemies. If you have plus four on, say, your helmet, or you have other plus levels somewhere, you can grab more nodes here for more damage to shocked. This is pretty good multiplier. It's 12% more per point. And then you also have a huge crit multi point here. This is quite a bit of damage as well. So if you have plus four, you can gain a lot of damage on your static orb. The reason why I have one unspent point here, and this is very important, is because if you're swapping between the Fragment of Enigma, which gives plus one lightning and another catalyst like Crystal Skull, if you do that with all of your points allocated, it will unallocate a point every time you swap from mana charge, which is very bad. So if I put another point here and then I take out Fragment of Enigma, it'll take a point out. So if you are doing a swap, make sure you leave one point allocated so that it does not take a point out of mana charge when you go to fight a boss, because you will lose a huge amount of damage. Very important. Focus, we mainly use to overcharge. This gives us a lot more burst. And then whenever you happen to be low, you can just tap it, and it gives you 40% of your max mana instantly. This is very strong when running Echoes. You're just going through, spending all your mana. You go negative, you tap it. If you have uh, 2,000 mana, that would instantly give you 800 mana. It's quite a lot. If you hold it down for a little bit more, uh, you get another 100 or so mana. You also get haste after channeling, so when you pre-channel before a boss, you get a little bit more haste while you're running to the boss. It's nice. Uh, so that's good. Then, yeah, everything else here is, is basically just about mana. Moving over to teleport. So we want a bit of cooldown here. We get some armor uh, after we use it. Some cold res. This is very nice. Some buff stuff. We take buff duration because the cooldown is a little bit long. We want to have these buffs up all the time because they are good. We have stun immunity. So this is very nice. If you are using the strong mind, you might not need this node. Uh, and yeah, cooldown recovery, of course. And then the other big thing here we have is Mana Tunnel. Mana Tunnel makes our next, next spell cost free. Most of the time we use this for Static Orb because it's very expensive. You can use this as a bit of a mana generator. As you see here, next spell cost is free. And then you can see I get quite a bit of mana back because of Archmage and Sorcerer. So that's kind of the idea here. While you're running through, you're tapping Teleport anyway because of Wrong Warp buffs then all you have to do is you just pop Static Orb after you teleport to regain some mana. That's pretty good. The Arcane Ascendant. So this is a skill that you use mainly for bossing and pretty much no other time. Uh, it does give you a bunch of damage, gives you a bunch of spell damage. There's even more spell damage. And then the big thing here is you get a 24% damage multiplier against slowed. So you do want to make sure you're slowing the boss before you fight it. So this is very important. Otherwise, that's pretty much it. This is just a damage buff that you're using to one-shot bosses. Pretty good stuff. For the boss one-shotting rotation, before you start fighting the boss, if you can, you use Focus to overcharge your mana. Then you want to hit the boss with Frostclaw to apply your stacks of slow to buff the Arcane Ascendance damage. Then you go to the boss, you use your Arcane Ascendance, use your Teleport, evade if you have to to get close again, and then you dump all your mana with Static Orb. If you find it a little bit awkward to do teleport and then evade, you can change the order if you want. You can start with teleport. Um, if you're using Jewel Ring, you need to make sure that you do your burst within the four second window of the ring buff. For mapping, it's pretty simple. You're just running through the map, hitting packs of enemies with Frostclaw. If you see something tanky, you just pop your teleport and ideally one shot it with Static Orb. 
And otherwise, while running around, you're using your Disintegrate plus Evade for mobility. And if you ever happen to be negative, you spend all your mana. You just tap Focus. You can get a little bit of mana back pretty quickly. And then while you're looking at the Echo thing, uh, you can also be charging Focus uh, while you're looking. So if I start holding it, you can hear I'm still focusing while doing this. Just a little tip for you guys. It's kind of cool. Moving over to the passives. So the passives are pretty straightforward. We are getting a lot of mana. We're getting some um, intelligence for our spark charges. We're getting crit where we can. And we are getting a little bit of teleport cooldown and stuff like that. Cast speed is still good. Uh, it makes our burst a little bit quicker. It makes our frost claws feel smoother while you're running through maps. Having cast speed means you're standing still less. So you are technically faster. Uh, Moving on to the Sorcerer Tree, this is what you're going to prioritize next, because this is the most important node in the build. Uh, otherwise, these nodes at the end here are very strong. We want a lot of mana, so there's a lot of stuff here that gives mana. Um, I guess I'll start here. So this is mana and ward per second per 10 max mana. This is what gives you the baseline mana you see here, almost 3,000. Uh, that's very good. The mana regen we get per max mana. This helps a lot while running echoes, sustaining your frost claw. This is very nice. The crit chance this is a big part of our crit scaling. Uh, so we have quite a bit of int. This gives us a lot of increased crit chance. Very good stuff. These are optional. If you don't want this stuff, you can put the points into int or something like that. When your gear is not very good, I would suggest you maybe don't run this and instead take uh, like intelligence here, for example. This will also give you ward decay threshold. Uh, so yeah, these points are very expensive. They're mainly to give you move speed, a little bit of spell damage, some cast speed. This is just purely for running echoes as fast as you can. Um, and then we also have the Lost Knowledge. This is where probably most of our ward generation comes from. When you cast a skill at least 40, you gain the ward based on your current mana. So you do want to try and keep your mana levels high while running echoes, which isn't too hard. So there you can see we get quite a bit of word from that. Uh, so that's good stuff. Then we get a bunch of crit chance here. It's doubled for lightning skills. So this is actually 20% crit chance per point. It's very efficient. I like these nodes quite a bit. Then we have crit multi. This is okay. It's 10 per point. Not bad. Um, and then yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much it. Archmage, as I said, is very strong. We have cooldown. Uh, and yeah, that's the sorcerer tree. Moving over to the Rune Master Tree. DR here, I really like this. This is optional if you feel like you don't actually need it. You can take these points out and put them somewhere that's going to give you more damage. So in this case, you still probably want to path here, so you would need to uh, reallocate within this tree a bit. These nodes, I'm basically just doing it for the cast speed and move speed. These are also optional. If you want, you can reallocate them into more intelligence or mana, uh, but yeah, we're not getting a whole lot from this, but move speed is very good, and I'm trying to speed clear as much as I can, so that's how we're set up right now. Uh, but yeah, we have mana, cast speed, DR, we have int, you can put any extra points you have here if you want, and then we have the bonus damage reduction from crits, this is very good, helps us get our uh, crit reduction cap, and a bit of int as well. In the spell blade tree, all I'm going to mention is that there's int here. If you really want to go all out on int, you can grab this. There's even more int here, but this one's a bit of a stretch. I don't think we have the points. If you're going for maximum frost plus spark charge damage, you could probably grab these ints, but it's it's going to be a pretty tight fit. So maybe not. Anyway, that's uh, pretty much all I have for the build. Uh, I hope you guys liked it. It's been a bit of a long video, so uh, definitely let me know if you have any questions. And as always, I will catch you guys in the next one. Cheers.